Frank, so much for coming in and uh, joining us today. Lots of exciting things happening right now in, in the space community. And, uh, you know, we, we've had launches of new telescopes that are sending us back some really cool images. Uh, I want to just touch base on the TELUS World of Science first. 35 years there, you are a veteran of the veteran when it comes to the science area here in, in, in not just Edmonton, I would say Alberta, you've, you've, you've touched kind of all over the place and people report back to you as we've discussed the, you know, off camera. So thank you so much for coming in and talking to us today. Maybe just give us a little bit of a rundown of, of your history and, and what you've done over at the, uh, at the Science Center. Sure, thanks for that introduction. Yeah, you know, I've been at the Science Center since 1986. Uh, Started there as just a part-time employee, as many people start off in some of their jobs that they do. And I was still a student at the University of Alberta studying physics and astronomy, and uh, and then you know finished that uh, degree and degrees, and then went into education, got my education degree, and then after that I started working at the Science Center full time. I was really planning on becoming an educator, teaching kids about you know physics, math, uh, yeah. astronomy, all that fun stuff. And uh, yeah, it's really cool stuff. And uh, an opportunity came up for me to work full-time at the Science Center. So I started my full-time career at the Science Center in 1991 and have been working there ever since uh, that time to present, yeah. taking on different roles, working uh, in our planetarium and look, overseeing that, overseeing our kids' programming, our science camps, so look, overseeing our exhibit gallery spaces, uh, our observatory that, where we have our telescopes set up. So lots of different things uh, yeah. that we've done over the years. Yeah, and it's grown so much over the years. I mean, I can't even imagine uh, just the development you've been able to witness from when it was uh, in its early stages to today with the advancements of technology, with the advancements of the exhibits. That's got to be something. Uh, pretty much. You know, when I first started there, we, uh, computers were like a thing that, <laughs> oh, you got a computer. That's neat. And it's a big thing. And it doesn't do too much green screen monitor. Yeah. You know, it really couldn't do much of anything. If you needed to find out what's happening in the space world, you had to get on the phone and call somebody that right. you had a, a number to to find out. Nowadays, you, say, uh, you got the internet. You got these fabulous uh, smartphones that give you information right there. But back in 1991, you know, it doesn't seem that long ago, but we didn't have any of these luxuries that we have today for finding out the latest and greatest information. We had to really get on the phone and call people at NASA and say, hey, what are you guys up to, you know? Or, or NASA would send out a big press uh, pamphlet that all the science centers and that would get to say what their missions were going to be like and yeah. what to look forward to. So, In a yeah. fax. <laughs> yeah, all, all, all this stuff, you know, it's it's really changed. Yeah. Uh, and it's amazing. And, you know, going from, you know, the planetarium when I first started working from slide projectors to do our shows. Oh, we did have a nice, you know, two million, uh, about a $1.6 million star projector in the dome, like uh, Zeiss projector, beautiful star fields. But every, all the other peripheral stuff in the, the, the dome itself was actually projected by slide projectors or other types of uh, projectors that uh, had some type of slide or something in front of it that yep. moved yeah. uh, to create like the Aurora or something else like that. Right. Nowadays, it's all done digitally through video projection and we can do like Hollywood style movies you yeah. know, if we really want. Yeah, and some of the exhibits you guys have had through there, uh, I mean, uh, one most memorable to me is, is Bodies. Uh, what are some of the other ones that you guys have had through that? Oh my God, we, we had so many. Yeah, Body yeah. Worlds was actually a, a one that we brought in first in around 2008. Yeah. And uh, we had to take out our old space gallery just to make room to fit that one in. Yeah. So we uh, had body worlds. We had uh, things uh, like the Harry Potter exhibit, very, very oh, yeah. popular. Yeah, it's not science, but it's fun, you yeah. know. And sometimes you want to do some of the fun things too. Yeah. Uh, we have the other galleries that deal with uh, different science topics, but again, our feature gallery can be anything. Right. So we brought in the Harry Potter exhibit. <laughs> so we had, you know, props from the movies and uh, places where people could try on the sorting hat and uh, <laughs> get sorted into their house. Yeah. Uh, and it just takes a look at movie magic. Uh, right. Before that, we had the Star Wars. Identities exhibit, which uh, yeah, had that was fantastic. Lucas's stuff, you know, so yeah. real props, real models from the, the Star Wars uh, movies, uh, their costumes, all that stuff. But it did have a bit of a science focus. You went around, you had a RFD tag you wore, and you went around and you had to decide, uh, you, know, you're, you know, as you go through life, the choices that you make. So you find out if you're going to go to the dark side of the force or if yeah. you're going to go to the good side of the force. Yeah. And it, it was really neat. And yeah. at the end, they kind of determined, like, what type of uh, character you would have been in the Star Wars universe mm -hmm. just by the choices you made. So there was some science in it, but there was also, again, all that movie magic that was uh, involved with it. And it was, uh, 
a really cool exhibit. Yeah, yeah. Um, recently, we had the Marvel exhibit, which looked at uh, Marvel comics and the characters created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and others. And uh, that was also highly popular because, again, these MCU movies oh, are, you know, yeah. they're the things you go to a movie theater right now. They're, <laughs> you know, that, those are the ones that are always, uh, you know, the highest capacity. The, the most number of people go see those things. Yeah. You know, they're fun movies. Uh, they, uh, you know, are pretty good uh, t in following the actual Marvel comic book uh, storylines and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, and they've got like the another set of Marvel Cinematic Universe movies coming. It's a whole new out. world. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. crazy. Another great exhibit was uh, was the James Cameron uh, exhibit, you know, and, and uh, you've mentioned movies and MCU with, with Marvel and stuff like that. Uh, the uh, the seeing the crossover of technology and industries to work together, you know, uh, watching James Cameron create these new subs, these new types of cameras to go down and capture imagery and, and discovering the Titanic and shooting those documentaries. That is such a cool thing to see uh, on, on how those the cohesion of, of two worlds, science oh, yeah. and, and entertainment can come together and, and I mean just telling story I guess at the end of the day right so that that's really cool stuff oh for sure yeah. absolutely so um, again we'll go back we're going to talk a little bit about this, some of the excitement that's been going on in the the science world specifically out into space um, Artemis Artemis yes. 1 uh, we just att attempted to launch that bad boy on Monday uh, had some had a few little oh, kerfuffles okay. but um, so they're going to reattempt uh, on the, the the second it was right Friday. That's right, Friday the 2nd at 10.48 uh, a.m. our gotcha. time. So not as early as this uh, first attempt yeah, at yeah. 6.33 in the morning. And, and we did have a lot of people out at the Science Center wanting to watch it uh, in our planetarium theater. Yeah. And we had a, a different feed also coming from the Kennedy Space Center, which uh, created a full dome image of the Cape area with the the rocket off in the distance. Yeah. Uh, so it was a big trial thing to see how that would work. And yeah. It, it, yeah, so it was a bit different, and we had people there anticipating this launch, and then, of course... At 6 a.m. At 6 a.m., right. yeah, we had yeah, a full yeah. theater, packed theater. That's awesome. I had various media outlets out there, too, want to get people's reaction to this new launch of this new uh, yeah. rocket from NASA. Yeah. But it kind of uh, couldn't go <laughs> off because, again, issues. And, yeah. you know, if we take a look back at other launches of the past, uh, the shuttle era had lots of problems where they got down to, like, four seconds before liftoff, and they had to cut the engines off and say, nope, this is a no-go, we got to problem here so and being a new rocket like this you know they want to make sure that uh, when they launch it that everything is working uh, the way it should because yeah. it is a test flight and they don't care about delays right now because a, again uh, they want to make sure the thing's going to work properly right. this is the time to kind of kind of get in there and figure out what's not working fix those issues so that the next time they do it with humans on board they hopefully won't have these issues come yeah up. Yeah, and you're talking Artemis 2. Artemis 2. And they're hoping to have that thing up in the air by 2024. So what uh, what kind of buzz are you feeling, you know, the excitement? I mean, it's been 50 years since we've attempted to go back to the moon. Um, and what kind of buzz, what kind of feelings are, are you sensing out of the community? You know, just seeing the people on there on Monday morning, so yeah. early in the morning, you know, you know, kids just couldn't even keep their eyes on. But as soon as they got in there, some kids were actually wearing like spacesuits and oh, things like man, that. Awesome. It was so cute, you know, yep. and, and it just shows that there is this rejuvenation in, in this excitement about space flight and that now we have a destination to go to again. We're not just ha sending people up into low Earth orbit, you know, which is okay. Yep. But really, you know, going to the moon or going to Mars now that's exciting stuff and yes. you know I think that really piques the interest of you know, a lot of people little ones and yeah. older yeah. individuals you know it's a uh, it's something we haven't done in a while and I think uh, it's something that could lead you know the younger generation now to say I want to do that yeah. and, and make them yeah. and just watching these kids come into our theater you know wearing these spacesuits and excited about watching this launch uh, just in our planetarium you know that tells you a lot about the interest that uh, people have in these types of events it's good to see the re like the revitalization of the interest and the passion too. Um, uh, the the plans that they're looking to do with these projects, Artemis one, two, and three, getting humans to the moon, but then just what they're looking at doing in in, in the cases of science exploration, uh, mining, mm. putting a base there. Like it's just there's so, like it's just like we went from zero to a hundred all of a sudden. It feels I know. Like, and it's just really yeah. Like, I, wow. I love these plans. I, I yeah. think we should have carried on with the Saturn V rockets and. Made Maybe yeah. change the rocket up back in the 70s. Who knows where we'd be right now? Yeah. But you know, the, the, in the U.S., the public interest in it kind of 
faltered. Even Apollo 13, you know, if you watch the movie, you know, they, they did live broadcasts on their way to the moon. And uh, by that time, people were already starting to tune out of that thing yeah. about the Apollo missions. Oh, we did that. We beat the Russians to the moon. We landed on the moon. That's all. Yeah. These other missions, oh, who cares about them? No, no. You don't stop something like that when yeah. you've got a good thing going. Yeah. Keep it up, right? World change. But, but you know, the, the public uh, impression of the, of the moon, they said, oh, we just got to spend more money here on the earth. We got all these homeless people. We got this and that, these problems. Yeah. Let's fix these problems. Have we fixed those problems in 50 years? No. But the thing that keeps going is, you know, the space flight, it, it really ignites the imagination. Get, there's a passion there. Yeah. It's exploration at its finest. You know, you, you, this is something that we should be doing. We should Built be. in our DNA. Really, the other day, it's in our DNA to, to get out and explore and discover, you know, and, and, and that's really cool to see that this has ignited that. Oh, so, oh yeah. it, it, it's wonderful. You yeah. know, I, I wish I were younger again because I'd love to be up on, <laughs> on that uh, mission. These going guys back will to be on moon. Mars and uh, we'll be long gone by, <laughs> at this rate. Um, Artemis 2, that's the one they're going to look at, at putting uh, people on it, humans on it, send them up there. Some really exciting things about Artemis 2 is the potential to have two. Canadian astronauts on that on that trip. Yeah, the the May uh, the May twenty twenty four projected launch will have one Canadian on board. Okay. Gotcha. Assured one Canadian. Okay. Uh, we've hired uh, two new Canadian astronauts that have now been fully trained. They're yeah. part of the Artemis group. So most likely those two astronauts, um, uh, Joshua Kutrick from. Uh, Fort Saskatchewan area, yeah. and then Jenny uh, from Calgary. Yeah. Two Albertans are part of the new astronaut crew, and they're going to be going to the moon. Now, one's going to go around this, uh, around the moon in 2024, hopefully, if everything goes well with these test launches. And uh, that's uh, that's pretty good for Alberta. Oh you know? man, that's <laughs> awesome! I love it. Yeah. So, and uh, of course, uh, there's other astronauts too, uh, Jeremy Hansen and David Saint Jacques. Uh, they are, I think, going to be more confined for the uh, low Earth orbit, the International Space Station. Okay. So they'll be going up there too. Yeah. Um, it's uh, not really clear exactly how the Canadian Space Agency is going to utilize these astronauts. But again, Jeremy Hansen, uh, I should say, Joshua Kutrick and, and Jenny. Yeah. Uh, they they were hired specifically for this up and coming Artemis mission. So. Gotcha. I think it's pretty exciting for them. If I yeah. if I were them, you know, I'd be like, oh my God, I might be going to the moon. Exactly. You know, this dream that they had. You know, being little kids thinking yeah. that you know, I'd love to go to the moon. I'd love to do what Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin did on that yeah. first flight, and uh, it's so exciting. Well, it should be exciting for all Canadians because oh, yeah. our foot's still in the door on on the discovery of potentially you know new new fields of of interest, new fields of exploration and then on top of that alberta has has a foot in there and that's that's super cool it is really yeah, really cool. yeah. And, um going into like some of the stuff we've done in the past as canadians like we had the space arm um so i mean this is this is again just amplifying how important and how awesome this is that we're that we're still in there and we're still doing things so and there's a lot of other things that are happening here in canada in regards to space as well i mean we've got some alberta-based companies that are still working on on space engines and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Tell me about some of the things you've come across in, in those worlds. Yeah, well, uh, again, just going back first to the uh, Artemis mission. Yeah. I mean, uh, with the Artemis mission comes something called the Lunar Gateway, which is a space station that, that's going to be orbiting the moon. And that's going to be a bit of a stepping stone down to the lunar surface and maybe on to Mars later on. Right. And Canada's got a role there to create a new Canada Arm for Canada Arm 3 that's going to be part of that. And that's part of our sort of commitment to the Artemis and to the Lunar Gateway mission, and that's what gives us a seat on board the uh, uh, Artemis II mission to the moon. So yeah, there, there's different companies in Canada involved directly with the Artemis mission and the Gateway mission. Yeah. But there's also other startup companies, even here in Alberta, there's a company called Space Engine Systems. And we had these individuals here at the Science Center when we opened up the Apollo exhibit in our traveling exhibit space. And uh, they have like this uh, rocket plane that they really want to uh, get out there. It looks quite uh, futuristic. And the idea is that they want to actually have uh, this construct of theirs actually, uh, you know, being used for uh, suborbital flights for, you know, regular folks like us or, you know, maybe even military applications. They're not sure yet. Right now yep. they're just, you know, looking for funding. They're doing a lot of work. Uh, they've got like uh, uh, a one uh, prototype that they want to fly, but they have to get all the regulations oh, and things like that, you know, is a red tape. A lot of red tape to <laughs> yeah. overcome. And, you yeah. know, they could use a little bit of support from the Canadian Space Agency and from even the federal government. Because again, it, if you look at across Canada, there's, there's some space companies for sure, mm -hmm. uh, MDA, 
is the one that's doing the robotic arm. Yeah. There's other little companies here and there, but uh, not so many companies here in Western Canada. So it's really diversify Canada's uh, role in space exploration and in new technologies. You know, seeing a, a startup company like Space Engine System out there, yeah. we really should be supporting them. You know, uh, I go back to the 1950s when Diefenbaker killed the Avro Arrow. We had a beautiful aircraft at that time. And this is before I was even born, mm -hmm. but you just hear the stories or read the books about the Avro era or watch the movie with Dan Aykroyd about it, you know, and you just see how stupid we were to, to just stop a, a program like that. Yeah. You know, it was top notch. It was far superior than anything else at the time. And this is Canadian ingenuity, Canadian scientists, engineers that worked on it. And, you know, we have a government that basically said, no, we're just going to give into the U.S. and, and uh, we're just going to close this thing down. Why would you do something like yeah. that? Well, think of where it would have been today had they kept it going we could have had a, such a s s jump leap forward already yeah we could have had an even better aerospace uh, you know industry here in canada if we yeah. kept that going yeah yeah i mean you know there are companies like bombardier and others that do you know aviation related mm -hmm. things aircraft and some others but you know we could have been so much better yeah. and uh, been a really big key player in the whole worldwide aviation industry if we kept the Avro company working yeah. uh, on those projects back from the 1950s onward. But no, what happened to all those great scientists and engineers? They went to NASA and they headed up programs there to get people from the US on the moon in the Apollo they era. That brain and, drain. They moved. Yeah. Pretty much. You yeah. know, and that's pretty sad for Canada. And you yeah. know, I talked to my friends that are going through engineering and students there. They they have a passion at the University of Alberta for space exploration. They even created something called the CubeSat, you know, and they launched one of these little small satellites in Earth orbit. So it gets the students at the University of Alberta building these little uh, satellites, and then they get to see what happens when they send it up and they oh, talk wow. to it using amateur radio. It's really incredible. Yeah. But you know, these students, they have a passion for this stuff. We need to keep this passion going here in Canada. We yeah. need to basically uh, give these students that are graduating with these degrees that have this uh, interest and uh, just passion towards doing stuff like this to do stuff like that here in Canada instead of having to go to the U.S. or who knows some other country. Right. Yeah. Well, hopefully projects like these Artemis, uh, you know, seeing this thing successfully get off the ground and 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 pull this mission off will just ignite more opportunities and like you said that passion and uh, there's a few here already which is great to see we just like to see that ball keep rolling oh for sure and uh, you're right like i mean western canada has a lot to offer and and uh, alberta and uh, just when it comes to resources and talent like we've got some killer talent you've mentioned the university of alberta i mean we're so far ahead in artificial intelligence over there with the U of A. Um, there's no reason that they can't start putting their fingers into more of this uh, this space orientated and exploration uh, technology. Right. So. Yeah. They just need support like everybody else. Yeah. Any good idea needs support. And, right. Uh, whether it's government support or private support, yeah. they just need support because they have great ideas. They have great ambition to do some great stuff. But they just need the support yeah. uh, from the community to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So the relaunch for Artemis uh, coming up on Friday. Are you guys going to be putting that up in the dome again? Yes, <laughs> we're, you are. We're going to try. <laughs> we're gonna uh, well, we're, again, this is uh, Tuesday right yeah. now. They're going to have a press conference at 4 o'clock at NASA to say if they're going to be going for launch on Friday or if they're going to postpone it to Monday gotcha. or if they're going to postpone it even longer. It all depends on the problem. Uh, right. The problem they had with uh, the launch on Monday, there was a, a few different things factors. Yep. There was the engine factor. So the first uh, thing that kind of came up was that they have to cool the engines and around the engine itself they have like liquid uh, hydrogen that, yes. that moves around to cool the engine. Yeah. That engine, that, that, that liquid hydrogen goes around there and then gets fed back into the engine. So it, it, as the liquid hydrogen goes around the engine, it pre-warms uh, pre the liquid hydrogen. So when it goes into the nozzle, you know, you get a yeah. better kind of explosion per se. Right. Um, but one of the number three engine wasn't actually doing that. It yeah. wasn't cooling to the appropriate temperature. So yeah. there was some fault, probably a valve. They had a, another issue with um, when they feed all this liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen into the main tanks of the big rocket. Uh, sometimes they get some venting or if they don't have a clip uh, plugged in properly, they lose some. Yeah. 
So they had an issue like that. And then finally, the third thing that put it, the nail on that particular <laughs> launch uh, was basically that the weather turned sour again. Yeah, was, pretty quick, yeah. Yeah, it was really, really bad. There's yeah. uh, some bad clouds coming in. And yeah. uh, just beforehand, a uh, few days beforehand, they did have some lightning at the Cape. And uh, mm. it, the lightning hit not the rocket, but some of the uh, lightning suppression towers that they had around the oh, wow. uh, 39B launch pad. So. Right, right. So uh, uh, it's good they have those precautions, but again, uh, the weather at the Cape is uh, can be iffy at this time of yeah, the year. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, Frank, so much. Uh, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us about this today and giving us some insights into this. Uh, just super exciting stuff. I love your passion, and uh, and yeah, for people to find out more, uh, they can go to the Tulsa World of Science uh, website, find out more, and uh, yeah, hope, hopefully get a good good crowd here on uh, on Friday, and we can get that puppy off the ground. And if not, we'll push her to Monday, and if not, we'll get it up there. It's gonna happen. Oh yes, it's gonna <laughs> happen. Yeah. So if people are out and about, uh, you know, we do have our public observatory open as yes. well in, on weekends. Uh, during the fall, uh, starting after the schools uh, let in, it'll just be weekends only, but we can show people Saturn's rings, Jupiter's yeah. cloud belts and all that stuff. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff up in our sky that you can just look at with your own eyes alone. If you come to the observatory at the Science Center, we can show you them through a telescope and really wow you. Yeah, yeah. When we were there a few, uh, a few days ago, there was things that we saw with our own eyes, that, but we didn't know what they were. And then you, you guys had your experts there to point out, be like, oh no, that's this and that's that. And seeing Saturn with your own eyes in that telescope, is it was pretty cool. It's, That's pretty cool. It's yeah. always an incredible sight to see. Yeah, you betcha. Good stuff. Thanks again. Thanks, Bryce. Bet. <laughs>